tēnā koe um, e taku rangatira, uh, ko whaewa ki te kōrero mō tēnā kaupapa whakahirahira. Um, let's just start from the very beginning, the stuff that I need to get. So tell me about Te Rau Paraha. Uh, who was he? What were his characteristics? <coughs> ah, well, uh, uh, kia, kia ora, tēnā ra wātū koe te tuahine o te rā koutou whakarongo mai nā. Um, well, there's lots of kōrero to do with Te Rau Paraha. Uh, lots of books have been written about him and uh, he's a man who's quite prominent in terms of uh, history within New Zealand and Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, so he was a very prominent leader um, of the Ngāti Toa people. Uh, as far as I understand, he uh, was prophesied, his, his birth was prophesied, uh, although there's a little bit of conjecture over the, who made the prophecy. My Ngāti Raukawa people will say that uh, Hape Ki Tuarangi of Maunga Tautari made the prophecy, whereas my Ngāti Tō people in Kāwhi will say it was Wera Wera. Uh, at the end of the day, there was a prophecy made uh, which sort of shows that uh, even prior to his birth that he was go going to become someone of substance and significance. And in fact, from the time that he was born and under the signs of which he was born, um, that a great tanifa would be uh, produced out of the union of Wera Wera and Parekoha to his mother. Uh, and from that time on, as far as I know, he was taken away and raised as a rangatira and, uh, and probably saw a lot of his first battles with his uncle, Hape Kituarangi of Maunga Tautari, because uh, we know that he spent lots of time, a lot of time with his Rokoa and Ngāti Huia people of, of Maunga Tautari. I just so, can, I, can I just whip you back to the, um, that prophecy? Because I really want that prophecy if I can. <laughs> no. Just grab the back of your jacket. Right. Stay seated and just... Yeah, that's oh, right. Sorry. Right. 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 Should we start again? No, no, no. no right. It's all beautiful. It's not live. So you want me to give a description on the prophecy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so cool. remember when Weta Weta wanted to marry... Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> We're talking about a prophecy. Yep. Uh, how did it start? Like, what's, what's the story? Well, according to um, uh, our oral histories, uh, Wera Wera of Kafia, who was a prominent chief of Kafia and the Ngāti Tō people, uh, went to Maunga Tautari and asked for uh, one of the daughters of Karaua Puta. Uh, on arriving there, and I suppose Karaua Puta having to weigh up the entirety of what that would mean of one of his daughters. Uh, as it was, all his daughters had been married off to various rangatira, uh, but he had one left there, and her name was Parekohatu, his youngest daughter, uh, one of his youngest daughters. And uh, Parekohatu uh, was a kiana te kōrero hari hari waimāku. She was like the old fella's kaingāko, or special one that would go and uh, help her father out in old age. And so... Um, when Weta Weta turned up and, and he says, oh, all I've got is rua, a pare kōhatu, engari hari hari, hari, hari wai māku, uh, he says, aha kō tēnā, Weta Weta said, aha kō tēnā, um, a great tanifa will be born from our union, and uh, he would be the exception to the rule, or herereke ki te ao. Uh, and so from that time of the prophecy, when the first child was born, uh, they took the baby to Weta Weta and asked if uh, this was the child, because that's a prophecy when he said a tanifa would be born from a great leader of, of Ngāti Tōa, marrying one of the younger siblings. And so um, that union produced the first of their, their babies. They went over and asked the old fellow if this was the baby that was seen in his prophecy. And uh, he quickly said, uh, Kao, uh, engari ka waiho ma te rangi e tohu. Um, um, oh, sorry. Ka waiho ma te rangi e tuku. And so that baby was called te rangi ka tukua, in remembrance of that. And so one by one, as each child was born, till eventually they got to, I think, about the fifth child. Uh, and his name was Maui Pōtiki originally. And then uh, he was taken over to the old fellow and he says, uh, when he looked at the baby, it was a scrawny 
sort of a baby, quite uh, um, small, I suppose, um, under new, uh, malnutrition. Oh, no, you get cut that out. Yeah, just a moment. Um, just, just have. I, where was I? You get undernourished. Undernourished, yeah. Yeah. He was. Scorched. And so when uh, okay, wait, so, so when the baby they took that baby over and what was the reaction? And so uh, when they took uh, the young the the baby over, uh, Maui Portiki or Tarobraha, uh, the old man looked down and saw that he had a special characteristic on his left foot, uh, which was the sixth toe, uh, and then he knew straight away, oh, this is the Tanifa or the leader that they saw that he saw in his matakite or in his um, prophecy. Uh, and so from that time on, Te Praha was taken away and he was uh, raised as a rangatira uh, and, and brought up in the whare tūtaua as a war chief eventually. Um, yeah. Okay, and stop doing that to your hand because oh, right, yes. that's cool. Um, so no, that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, so he, he yeah, what, what, what I mean, I guess, you know, when you're raised in the kura or the whare tu taua, mm. tau, what is that, you know, what would have been his life? So his life would have been um, involved with all of the machinations of the running of his tribe. Uh, as a young boy warrior, uh, and of course, it's not like the youth of today, where they have a have the opportunity to have a teenagehood or an adolescence, whereas our ancestors literally went from being children to adults. Uh, and so he would have grown up as part of that. As far as I, my understandings are that they soon saw that he was very adept at leadership, uh, his prowess in the whare tūtaua, his ability, especially in the use of a taiaha. Uh, although short in stature, apparently had a big booming voice um, and was able to eventually take over the leadership of Ngāti Toa through the Ngāti Kimi here, Hapu of Ngāti Toa, which his father was a main leader of. Uh, and if you think back a generation before at the Battle of Hingākāka uh, through Pico Tarangi, uh, and Ngāti Timonu, the leadership now had changed. And so uh, for Ngāti Kimi here, that would have absolutely been uh, Te Rauparaha's family and Te Rangi Hayaten and them uh, as a family leading uh, Ngāti Toa. What was his vision for Ngāti Toa, do you think? I, I think uh, his vision for personally would, would be First and foremost, not to have lead a subservient life underneath his Tainui relations. I think there would have been anything worse for a Maori, Maori chief uh, to live a subservient life under anybody, let alone their own relations. And as far as I understand that, Te Raupraha had done enough uh, to brass off most of his relations in Tainui, and of course that was uh, the time of when we... Uh, left Taharo and Kafia and made our way down in the heke Tahu Tahuahi. Explain the heke for us. For those heke means know. a journey or a migration, uh, and there's different types of heke. There's exploratory heke or journeys where you can just go for a look at a place, or you can um, have a heke where you go to uh, conquer lands. And so Taropaha had been on an exploratory. Uh, expedition in 1818, 1819 with Ngāpuhi uh, and then by the time he had got home the desire uh, to move back, uh, move down to Te to, to Whanganui Atara ki Te Upoko Tika ki Kapiti, Manua Tū, had really grown within him. Uh, we say that he, he tupuake te, te whakāru i rute te ngāka o te raupraha, so that the, uh, that had really grown in him to come down to the to the south. Uh, there's probably two main reasons why they came down. It was because of the statement made by the Ngāpuhi chiefs at a place called Ōmere, uh, which is probably one of the most poignant times in our history of Ngāti Tō, because when they saw a kaipuke or a ship out on the Cook Strait, we know today that that was the Bellhausen. It was, a, I think, a German or Russian um, a trading ship that had been at the top of the south. Uh, and so uh, when they saw it, uh, one of the Ngāpuhi chiefs who, who Te Raupraha was in the company of, and, and I mean, that, 
we we know that Tufari was there from uh, uh, Ngāti Whātua and uh, Ngāpuhi chiefs like Tamati Wakanene uh, and Patuone. Well, one of those chiefs had said to Te Raubraha, hey Raha, you see that ship out there? Uh, you better come down here and occupy, occupy this land. And if you can get close to the, those traders, you'll be able to get guns and become a great iwi like Ngāpuhi. And so I suppose that Kōrero had sat in the Ngāko. Uh, he had been contemplating that all the way back home until eventually when he got back to Kāwhia, things had escalated in his 18-month to two-year absence in Kāwhia between the local tribes and so the other take that they came down was because Waikato and Maniapoto and the animosity between Waikato and Maniapoto and Ngāti Toa and the Kafia Harbour tribes had gotten to the stage of probably uh, virtual, uh, um, well, eventually us having to leave Kafia. Um, well, Te Rangi Haiata, um, like Te Raupraha, um, would have been brought up in, in, in Kafia. Uh, and involved with all the happenings of his tribe. Uh, we know that Te Rangi Haiata is a nephew on his, on one side of Te Raupa, on the mother's side, on his um, Ngāti Raukawa side, but he's actually a cousin to Te Raupraha on his father's side, to Rākāheria. Um, so with that, uh, there's some variance in terms of the age difference between the two. But Te Rangi Haiata, my way of thinking, is probably only about a half a dozen to maybe if 10 years younger than Te Raupraha. So he grows up in a post hinga kaka situation where Ngāti Tōhe just suffered a major defeat. Uh, I would assume that he, like Te Raupraha, uh, took over the mantle of the, as the, one of the war chiefs or lieutenants. And I sort of associate the two as being... Uh, if you look at them in the characteristics between the two of them, Te Raupraha is like the consummate CEO, uh, leading the people, trying to find all the great advantages of, uh, of leading the people, whereas Te Rangi Haiata would have come more from the traditional type of thinking, a, a tohunga in his own right, uh, and a tohunga's characteristic is really based on my way or the highway, uh, a dictatorship, however you want to talk. So those two personalities, I think, was the success of uh, Ngāti Tō making their uh, way down the south here. And when I say success, that coupled with the leadership of our wahine uh, ended up becoming the combination of uh, success. And so in the any time of absence of Te Raupraha, Te Rangi Haiata tended to take over. We know this because at the Battle of Taharoa uh, in Kafia, Te Raupraha had got quite sick. And so we know that Te Rangi Haiata took over a lot of that um, running and organising of that battle. And so it had lots to do with all the way down uh, the West Coast in terms of the, what I call the West Coast Alliance uh, between Kafia and Taranaki. Um, Te Rangi Haiata was a person who wouldn't wear Pākehā clothing. Uh, as far as he was concerned, the only good thing that they brought over was guns, tomahawks and all those things that were used to used in warfare. Um, and I suppose uh, uh, he was known to have a bit of a, uh, a liking towards a bit of rum and tobacco, I think was the, one of the new substances they were using back then. And so he had set up trades with whalers on Mana Island, he resided on Mana Island. Um, he fought his way with Ngāti Tōa through all the battles of his people in Kāwhia, all the way down from Kāwhia, and right up until contact uh, with the colonial government. So they would have been, I, I guess to make them as sort of being around the 50s, mid 50s when they arrive here, uh, which sort of seems reasonable in terms of Māori leadership. That sort of tends to be the time it takes a a fair while, and um, Te Raupraha and Te Rangi Haid had done enough to elicit the support of their people. And I think one of the gifts of Te, Rangi, of Te Raupraha was his ability to sow his thoughts into the hearts of the people. Um, and so with his desire to move south uh, under this new, relatively young leadership, 
Uh, I, I think it also contributes to the success of, of Ngāti Tō's heke and migration south. So um, he, uh, Rangi Haiata and Te Raupraha, would have been experiencing the contact with uh, settlers and whalers and the new colonial government together as a relatively new thing. Um, that's yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And so <coughs> they arrive here in Te Whanganui Atara yep. and they make good alliances oh. with Ngāti Tama and Ngāti mm. Mutunga. Isn't that's because, and do you think that's well planned? And that's what they did on the Heke Down? Yes, um, the, I think Te Raupraha knew quite early on that in order for him to be successful that they would have to strategise their Heke. Uh, they would have to pick the right time and, and I think that by the time he got back after the army or Fenua, he must have had a feeling that it was time to, to go, that uh, things had escalated beyond a point of having a uh, tatau paunamu or a peace pact, uh, which had already been broken and on a number of occasions. Uh, and so with that was the Battle of Taharua and they made their way down. Um, I just, I keep That's right, on the way, I'm just... So they I just wanted to make the point that... Um, um, and so when they get to Taranaki, uh, and where this is actually, it's it's uh, we know this because on the uh, on the first heke of the army of Finua with Napui, uh, Tarangi Hayata himself took the wife to Pikinga of Ngati Upper, and the thought of that was uh, that they would have a place as a bit of a uh, respite uh, from enemy as they were coming down through Taranaki, Wanganui, the Rangitika, and Horo Finua. So. Uh, they, which of course they did. They stayed with her Ngāti upper people. Uh, so it was planned. They stayed in Taranaki for a couple of years, uh, 18 months, at a place called Te Pao Tumuana. And it was lucky enough that um, our Ngāti Mutunga and our Ngāti Tama connections, who, who uh, which, which are extensive in the Whakapapa of Kāwhia, uh, uh, they gave us a pa, I suppose, to recover from what would have been a pretty traumatic uh, um, ordeal for a lot of them, considering that they then had to make the decision of leaving their ancestral burial caves and homes and place of wahi tapu, um, which today may not seem like a big thing, but I think back then it was huge. Mm. For any Polynesian, Māori to leave their bones uh, would have been quite a hard thing to do, but they did. Um, and there's a few events that recall the trauma of that. Uh, and they broke it up into sort of literally two sections, to tar one, one heke to Taranaki, and then from Taranaki down to Rangitike Manua too. Until eventually they took Kapiti Island where they were able to get a bit of respite from the um, tit for tat type uh, harassment that they were getting from the local iwi take take, who, you who we have to understand were residing here for a very long time um, prior to Ngāti Tō coming down. Um, but under um, the law of Tu Matauinga and uh, Uenuku Kaitangata, the local ahika was exterminated and, is that a good way of saying it? The local people uh, were usurped from the area and of course at the Battle of uh, Waiorua in 1824, um, Ngāti Toa send to Mana Whenua over the whole district, literally from... Uh, the Rangi TK to towards the top of the South Island. Mm. Are you sure? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so by now we're in 1830. So uh, I don't know, are we? Yeah, yeah, yeah a, a, around about that period. So when they finally arrive in Te Whanganui Atara after this long journey mm. through Taranaki, Whanganui, Manawatu, Rangi TK, then here. Where did, your, where did Te Rangi Hayata and Te Rau Paraha settle? Uh, yeah, so um, initially all of Ngāti Tōa were held up on Kapiti Island until the Battle of Waiorua. And then after the Battle of Waiorua, uh, lands were allocated. Um, ko tēnā ranga tira ki tōna whaitua. Ko tēnā ranga tira ki tōna whaitua. Meaning that each different chiefs uh, of Ngāti Tōa um, different chiefs that were associated or allied to Ngāti Tō were given different areas. And so Te Raupraha himself took the island fortress of, of Kapiti, 
where he resided, uh, uh, and he also resided in a place in, in Ōtaki. And so he spent a lot of his time travelling around, making sure that, well, kai was being grown. Uh, because as you know, you can't have a successful army without food. And so as things started to escalate, uh, the procurement of food became hugely important. So uh, he went around making sure that all those māra were secure for future campaigns. Um, so he lived on Kapiti Island, and of course Kapiti is a huge strategic positioning in terms of accessing to the Waiponam. Um, down with Tarangi Hayata, he, he ends up uh, moving to Mana Island, um, or takes to Mana Okupe. And so he resides on uh, Mana Island and, uh, and he carves his own whare tūpuna, so he was a carver, he was a poet, he was a great warrior apparently tall, uh, with very aquiline features. And, um, and, and so he lived on Mana Island in a whare called Kaitangata with his mother Waitohi. And so between those two on those islands, uh, we're able to um, uh, run the whole area, I suppose. Um, and, yeah, and, and of course, once they established those island fortresses, uh, they were able to uh, further campaigns into the South Island. Meanwhile, in the same rohe, well, you know, their whanaunga um, Te Rongo, um, mm. was being married off to um, Blinkensop. Mm. And, you know, I guess other, this was probably a plan, right? You know, that these oh. marriages were important. Yes, uh, they knew about trading and things. So, yeah, w would that have been... What, what would be the next plan for people like Te Rau Paraha and Te Rangi Hayata to, to strengthen their iwi? Yeah, I think initially it was all about um, the, the whalers and access to whalers and the resources that they provided. And so you'll find that lots of Ngāti Tō families come from a Pākehā or a whaling uh, genealogy in Māori. And so lots of us like uh, Waipunaho, who was the daughter of Te Rangi Hiroa, uh, she was married to Stubbs, to a George Stubbs, who was an English whaler. Uh, and there's lots of the Barretts, that I think of the Barrett name. Uh, I think of the Bolts, I think of uh, Gordy Bolts, I think his name was, Hori Porti. Uh, these are all half-caste Māori and products of that time and indicative of the uh, contact with Māori. So, um, yeah, they would have strategically done all that. Um, uh, my understanding that Te Rongo's husband, uh, Blinkensop, had a lot of access to, the, to a ship and he had, uh, I think, arranged something about a cannon, but uh, uh, we know what happened about the cannon incident and then, of course, the foray uh, over at uh, Waido. Yeah, so um, what do you know about uh, the relationship between Blinkensop, Te Rau Paraha um, and the land deed? Um, my understanding is is that yeah there was there was a relationship there obviously uh, one of trust initially in terms from uh, in terms of our iwi and our people uh, we know this because when he signed the paper um, as far as my understanding was it was like a, a rental that there were some people he was told that there's some people here going to use your land and if you sign this paper you'll get this this and that uh, so obviously there is some uh, understandings lost in translation there, uh, however you want to look at it. Uh, but I think Blinkensop had worked out that the Waido was a place of huge resource and fertility in terms of the land. Uh, Ngāti Tō had recognised that from our initial arrival. And in fact, it was like a, considered a personal pantry of Te Rauparaha, where he would quite often go down there hunting ducks and eeling and all that stuff. So. Those are big, big things, food, uh, the types of food, Māori kai, that you can procure um, because the energy that's required to run war campaigns. Uh, so those places become pantries, literal pantries, and huge areas of significance. So when it did escalate down there, um, I can see why they would have got upset. Uh, and, of course, um, the issues around the posse 
coming over to arrest the Rauparaha and, and make an example of this guy uh, for the colonial government. Did I answer that question? Yeah, media has talked a lot about what happened at Wairau, given yeah. she's the descendant of Te Rungo, So, um, but it happened, it happened. Um, I d wondered if you had anything to add, actually, as to the fact that, you know, um, they were, would have been getting older um, mm. by the 1840s, by 1840, they would have been getting on. Um, they didn't, you know, if they, they, they were experts at war, strategists, practitioners, um, it didn't appear that they were arriving there for a fight. No, yeah, What do you think absolutely. they were there for? No, absolutely not. As far as uh, my history and, and the history of our people is that Ngāti Tō never had the intention of going to fight. And um, we have an expression in our tribe um, that sort of encapsulates the whole incident. Um, and, and if I recall, it goes something like, um, Kaori Ngāti Tō e haere atu, uh, ki te whaf, ki te wairau, ki te whawhai, i haere ki te kōrero. Um, nā wai rā, nā wai rā, ka tupu te raru raru, uh, ka take te pū, ka mate arongo. And that's an expression of fear, that uh, Ngāti Tō never went down to the wairau to fight. In fact, they went down there to kōrero. And when they got there, the situation escalated. Uh, and then this expression of ka kome kome te tau o te pākeha is an expression of fear that one of those Pākehā soldiers in there was so scared uh, that he let off a stray bullet. Unfortunately for the settlers of the time, uh, that bullet hit Te Rongo, uh, which was one of Te Rauparaha's principal wives at the time. Uh, and of course that, that meant that he was able to exact utu or revenge reciprocity for the death of his wife. And uh, we know how that played out today. Um, so it's partly uh, misfortune uh, that it was unlucky that that incident escalated the situation. Uh, secondly, the fact of, of producing the chains when Thompson wanted to uh, arrest Teropraha must have sent a wave of panic through the Māori community that were down there at the time because in a Māori cultural context and especially in the times of my ancestors it would have been better to be killed and eaten than to be made what we call a here here or prisoner. There was nothing more degrading than to live a subservient life under another person. You would be better off dying. And so if you take that into account when those chains were produced uh, what's the attitude towards uh, Thompson, the Wakefield posse and those settlers from Nelson who had turned up with really with the explicit intention of not talking uh, because when Teropraha and them first had contact with the settlers, he said, let us sit down and talk. That's a Maori way of doing things. A Maori way of doing things is you sit down and you talk. And they didn't want to sit down and talk. They produced those chains and said that they were there to arrest Te Raubraha. Well, the situation escalated and unfortunately um, it ended with the death of Te Rongo and those settlers on, on above the Tuamarina hill there. And if you ever go there, you can, you can see the lay of the land and uh, the crossing of the Tuamarina stream, which was quite a deep stream. And the awkwardness of doing that, although quite narrow, um, would have been quite an awkward uh, situation for them to be held on. So Ngāti Tō being there, had got there a little bit earlier, had already settled into the area, knew the area very well. Um, and so when it, when it eventuated the way it did, uh, and the remainder of the settlers made their way up the Tua Marina Hill, um, asking for a truce, asking Te Raupraha, literally begging him to talk and he was quite adamant that, that they'd be right and that they would be all right and he would be able to um, settle the situation. But when the word had come from Te Rangi Haiata that Te Rongo uh, had, had been killed, uh, he knew, I think, straight that there was no way that he could stop his nephew or his cousin from exacting the Māori uh, utu uh, that was required. 
Do you um, think, um, you know, the fact that they were over there, because you're, you're talking about how the Wairo was like the food bowl, the pantry, they were really important for those campaigns. Te Rau Paraha and Te Rangi Hayata were living over here on these motu out here. Was that a bit of an occupation heading over to Wairo with that group? I think it was absolutely a reaffirmation uh, to the colonial government, also probably to some of the whanau down there that, you know, we still have very much have a huge interest in this land and um, I think that they didn't, if they wanted to go to fight, they would have taken an army. Uh, but he took his wives and they took some of their children, we know this, and a few armed uh, soldiers. But other than that, that's the ultimate expression of Māori coming in peace. When you take your wives and your children uh, and you're going under a truce of rongo and not under the battle, f battle flag of tūmātauinga, I suppose. Um, yeah, so we know this, um, and that while they were down there, it escalated and mm. it resulted in, in what happened. What happened? So we'll, I, I can leave that there because uh, media covers she quite a bit of that. But um, following that, um, what was the consequences really? Yeah, well, that's the thing with the white over years and years. Uh, it's always talked about in isolation, as that's the. The, the boiling over point um, and the pretext to that has never really been discussed and also, um, what could I say, the causal effects of what happened at Waido was to set Ngāti Tōa in a cataclysmic collision uh, with the new colonial government and of course the new kāwana who was uh, George Grey, um, of course under Fitzroy, uh, Fitzroy? Um, he ended up eventually pardoning uh, Te Rangi Hayata, which must have upset the uh, local uh, settlers, the colonial settlers, who demanded revenge for the death of those people. And, and I think in a way, Te Rangi Hayata must have known, in my way of thinking, he would have been pretty much on edge after the Waido, thinking that at some stage you're going to come and get him. And so he would have lived with that. Uh, to eventually the causal effects of all that Wairo um, meant that Kawana Grey was to redeploy uh, different battalions uh, from around New Zealand into the hut uh, and putting an end to this resistance of Pākehā buying land in the hut and, and Wellington put into an access. So it was very important for the Wakefields of the time Wakefield Company or the New Zealand Company uh, because they had, and I feel sorry for a lot of the settlers, they come over from Europe, coming here, their whole life savings, and they weren't very rich people, is my understanding. Um, well, a lot of them weren't. The, and so when they got here, there was no land divvied up for them because it was all Tarangi Hayata had said that you can't pass White's Lines east and west, which is a road in Petoni. As soon as you pass those, that line, uh, will be in conflict. And the reason was is that Te Rangi Hayata had been paid out for the hut. Most of Ngāti Tōr had been paid out for the hut. And so did uh, Te Raubraha. But Ngāti Rangatahi, who were another sub-tribe of Maniapoto, also residing down this way as allied forces to Ngāti Tōr, uh, were living there. And they weren't given the same gratuity. And so Te Rangi Hayata took exception to that. And he gave them their word. And, and if you know the manner of that chief, once a, your word was given, once those words leave your mouth, uh, you're expected to fulfil what you say. And so Te Rangi Hayata supported them right through that and that's where you get the incidents at the Bullcott Farm uh, and the, of course the Battle of Horokiri or Horokiwi. Post, post. Post the yeah. Waido. Yeah, yeah. Talk, talk to us about what happened after that, you know, with the change of from Fitzroy to Governor Gray, did they ramp it up? Oh, they absolutely, yeah. Things ramped up for us at Ngāti Tor because they really needed to get um, the land settled for these settlers that had already started coming from Europe. Um, and with that, they crossed over um, at Petoni there and usurped the Ngāti Rangatahi out of the hut. Tangi Hayata were the force uh, of, of Ngāti Tō and Ngāti Huia, uh, supported the Ngāti Rangatahi, and under Te Mamaku, who had Ngāti Rangatahi, and Te Mamaku was the chief of the Whanganui, but he had a lot of relations to Maniapoto, 
relationships to Ngāti Tōa. And so he had that fighting force. Uh, also, we know that Taringa Kuri uh, was part of the battles at um, Pawa Tahanui. And he had Ngāti Tam and Ngāti Mutunga under him. And, and, Ngā, and Tarangi Hayata had Ngāti Tōa and mostly uh, Ngāti Huia of, of Ngāti Rauka was supporting them. So he had a, quite a big force there um, with the understanding that after Waido, he would have been on high alert. He would have looked at all their pā, not just in Porirua, but all the way up through, and he would have selected where he could take on the might of the British Empire. And when I think about how underplayed that battle is, when essentially it's the start of Māori resistance in Aotearoa, when a couple of angry chiefs down in Porirua there decided that, no, they, they wanted to see how they could take on this mili the military might of Kawana Kare. And so they did. And he set up, uh, in my way of thinking, um, a military masterpiece in the ruse of Mātai Taua. Um, so after Waido, he looks around, all his coastal path, they'll get smashed by um, the new ships and the guns and, and the cannons. So he built his fortress at Mātai Taua, which is in the inlet of the Pawa Tahanui, uh, which was only a ruse, he pō pō noiho te tūngō te rāpā, meaning it was just to attract the military there. So they had a whole military force coming from Petoni, uh, from Mawai Hakon, or the hut coming up what we call now as Haywards Road. They also had another crew coming up through the Ngauranga Gorge. Uh, and this is the brilliance of Te Rangi Hayat and Te Raupraha, it's because it wasn't about winning a war, it wasn't about winning a battle, it was winning about winning a strategic position. And the reason is, is that he held them out for seven days. He held them out and the, and the key focus of that seven days was to enable the woman and the children to make relative safety back to Otaki. So that was the focus of that whole battle. Uh, the fact that he had established Mātai Tau in a pretty quick way, where, but it was just the shell. Uh, and by the time the military forces got there, they had spent a lot of energy uh, for nothing, uh, because the real fight was to take uh, another... The next stage of the fight was to be a little bit further down at uh, Horokiri, uh, which he had set up a, 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 a um, two-par sniper's pass, or two points, two puke. Um, I'm and going to just start again, so I get that one tell us, um, tell us about the next phase, which is Horokiwi. So after the, he had drawn everybody into Mātai Taua, um, the conditions of the weather were, were absolutely horrible. Uh, so he used that to his advantage. Um, his strategy was to hold them off for seven days. So he knew that he could take them on at Horokiri because there was um, the features of the land were very prominent. Uh, sh sh uh, oh, there were very prominent features in the land that were very hard for the colonial militia to get cannon up, mortar up. They would have had to cut trails in. Uh, he had spies in the Pākehā camp in the fact that Rawiri Puaha, because one of the main features of war and success of war is deception. And uh, so he had Rawiri Puaha say that he was going to be a, a, a kūpapa and a kāwana man. And so he got a hundred rifles out of the kāwana to um, chase Te Rangi Hayata. But uh, according to our people was that he was actually leaving powder down in the swamps. He was leaving shot. He was leaving guns. They were having hui every night in order to keep Te Rangi Hayata and their people safe. Now, none of that's ever recorded in Pākehā history because that's part of our oral history. And so there's even a point in the, in the uh, battle at Horokiri when they're trying to scale up the cliff face there of Rawiri Puaha and them being in the front at the vanguard shooting blanks, making out that they were um, pursuing Te uh, Tarangi Hayata, going around a corner <coughs> and then... Uh, Te Rangi Hayata and Ngāti Tōa letting a whole lot of logs down to just to slow down the progress, uh, obviously just making it harder. So a lot of it was about making it difficult. I understand that Nohorua had already positioned a barracks 
and that's Te Raupurahā's brother, Noho Rua Te uh, had established the barracks at Ngāti Tō Domain. And um, Te Raupurahā was in a sort of state of neutrality over at Taupōpā. So all the time these chiefs, are all get, they've already had it sorted, what positions they're going to make, who's going to be doing what, because you need to have intelligences, you need to know what the, what the enemy are doing all the time. And so by positioning the barracks at uh, Ngāti Tō Domain was quite a clever move because they were able to trade, uh, they were able to keep information about where uh, the military were moving. And so that was the type of control and information that Tarangi hired at. You never hear about those things in the way Pākehā historians talk about um, Battle Hills is like it's inconsequential, it was nothing. It is if you're on the side of the military might, but when you're a little group of people who have just, and we're only a small tribe, but have have a uh, a huge sense of of uh, who we are, uh, I think when you're a little tribe, you're always trying to punch above weight. And I think really essentially that was the legacy of Ngāti Tōa and their whole coming down from Kāwhia and, and taking on the British and fighting for the Fenu was that they were able to punch above weight through the stratagem of their leadership at the time. Um, and, and so that was the result that, like I said, set us in a collision course mm. uh, with Kawana Gray and the new colonial government. Some might say, okay. some might say it was the demise of Te Rangi Hayata and Te Rau Paraha, but what I'm hearing from you is that the strategy was to stay alive. The strategy was absolutely to stay alive. Kamate, kamate, kaora, kaora. You know, it's death, it's death, it's life, it's life. It tells us that in those days, that's, that's what it was. It was life and death situations. And the wrong decisions could have a horrible effect on, on, your, on your hapu, your whanau and your tribe. And, and the next generation survived. And the next generation survived to be able to tell the true story. And uh, Ngāti Tōa post-settlement have the ability now to tell our story. And, and I think with a new perspective on the Waido, a new perspective on Battle Hill and Te Rangi Hayat and Te Raupraha is absolutely needed because we've been um, the product of other people writing about us, um, writing for us, and now we have the opportunity to tell our story. Um, and that's, that's the story of uh, a part of the history of, of Ngāti Tōa um, with colonial contact and our part that we played in the Māori land wars, um, which was quickly, in terms of Pākehā historians, and, and of course Pākehā, Pākehā propaganda machine had already started working against Te Rangi Hayata and Te Raupraha, um, and so that just fueled. In the end of the end, though, Te Raupraha was imprisoned. Um, Te Rangi Hayata had to live a life of, although relatively free, um, but in, in ex exile up at Pro Um When he had fought for seven days, um, Taringa Kuri or Te Mamaku had says, Me putatu tato e nai ne ke hama matakau wairunga ki te kau wairaro. And the meaning of that is that the chief had told Tarangi Hayata, I think we better go now before the upper jaw closes on the lower jaw. Uh, and so they did. Uh, and I think the last statement that I understand is that Tarangi Hayata had said, and this is part of the deception, uh, that Ngāti Tō and Te Aotearoa, you fight with words. But you tell Kawan Nekre if he wants to have a fight on me to me pro And that's what we call the statement of the Puru Taua. And the puru tower is the cork of war. And if he wants to pull the cork, tell him to come up to Pro Tafa. Of course, um, Kawana Grey had sort of pursued them over Poafa, which was the big hill at Paikakariki, where Transmission Gully goes through now, or Te, te Aranui or Te Rangi Hayata, in commemoration of his great uh, feat of taking on the might of the British Empire at Pawatahanui and then an escape route. And then they, they went to uh, Waikanae, and I think Kawana Grey even made his way to Waikanae. Um, but at the end of the day, he pursued, didn't pursue Ngāti Tō any further, because I think the 
objective for him was as long as Tarangi Hayata was out of Wellington and he could carry on with those, um, with what he was doing in Wellington, which was, I suppose, the continued undermining of Ngāti Tōr's supremacy in order to establish the cities of Wellington, Nelson and Blenheim. Um, yeah, it's funny how history plays out, isn't it? Um, you could look at, there was a bastion of resistance um, for a certain period of time, uh, but I think that just the effects of colonisation uh, being um, subjugated, coerced, the Pākehā land machine had really taken on a, a, a new form and, and they, they, it was exigent. They just wanted everything. I think Te Rangi Hayata and Te Rauparaha could see that. Um, and so I think they did the best they could and if anything set an example that for this at the south end and for all of Māori done really that um, they refused to live underneath the mantle of, uh, of the kāwana. Uh, Te Rangi Hayata, although in exile, still managed to live to be one of our last truly free Ngāti tōa, living under his own tino ranga, tiratanga and mana motuhake, which I think is very much a Māori trait, better to live to fight another day uh, than to be made a here here. And so he did everything in his power and his means and, his, and as knowledgeable as he was, um, for the survival of his, for his tribe of Ngāti, Ngāti Tōa and all his allied uh, tribes that, that helped Ngāti Tōa get here um, uh, underneath the, the mantle of Te Raupraha, his uncle Te Raupraha. What's the, what's the iwi's relationship with the Crown today? Yeah, well, we're post-settlement now. Uh, so one could say that um, that, that, that the, the war, sort of the fight's a little bit, we're in the par and the, and the fight's not so full on. We, we, a lot of us protested Waitangi for many years, but our kaumatu and our elders have told us that now that we're post-settlement, obviously there's still going to be challenges with contemporary claims and we need to keep an eye on that. But uh, as far as we could see, there's that Ngāti Tō have done quite well out of the treaty claims. And when I, when I say that, I think Per capita, I think we're one of the uh, biggest tribes, uh, biggest claims lodged with the tribunal per capita. So that says something. Uh, the amount of culpability um, accorded to the the Kawana for what they did, they put us in reserves. All those things that they did, a lot of the land was taken through various legislations over the years and Public Works Act eventually. Uh, and we're able to get a little bit of culpability through the treaty claims process. But remember, the treaty claims is only based on a formula of 1%. And I've got a lot of Pākehā friends, I've got a lot of non-Māori friends, and I've got a lot of, and I've been a Māori a long time, and I can tell you nobody in their right mind signs up to any partnership for 1%. But the generosity of our people, eh? the Māori race, in order to go through uh, and better our people, we have to take a 1% uh, with the fact, with the thought that that would be able to help proceed, uh, progress and develop our people. So, yeah. Uh, do, do you think um, one of the greatest successes with money to the side, money for that train to go, if you put money to the side is if you reflect on, you know, your childhood and perhaps your dad's or your mum's generation of real kore, mm. you know, mātauranga kore, mm. and now today you're seeing something quite different? Yeah, I, I, today, in comparison to my upbringing, you know, te reo Māori was a four-form option. <laughs> uh, do they still call it four-form? Uh, with the advent of kōhanga and kura kaupapa, you know, these and, and the land marches of the early 70s, that we were all a part of as kids. Well, you, actually, you welcomed them. Yes, you we know, poor I remember meet, seeing Finna Kupa and, and our old Farikai and uh, thinking, wow, she looks really old. And, uh, and our old Farikai was a fireplace old Farikai, the Punga, and it was beautiful. 
uh, and the smoke and the smells. I have vivid memories of that. I have vivid memories of Eva Rukard talking to our people on our marae takapua here in front of Matua Iwi and Tōranga Tira, which were our two whare there. So, um, women of influence, leadership, leaders of influence that help influence Ngāti Tōs. Uh, and Ngāti Tō will always pōwhiri iwi and manaki our people, um, especially with a kaupapa like the Māori Land March, where it was done with mana and dignity and... You know, they came down and they talked and they, they, they talked through the night, they karakeered and um, that was a great way of rallying the people. Um, so when I look back now, it was, I think it was absolutely important that uh, Ngāti Tō get involved and because we are the gateway to Pōneke and we have mana within uh, Pōneke, um, we help represent uh, Parliament. Uh, along with our Aotearoa relationships, and we know this because uh, the Taonga um, Tafito Whenua at Tarangi Hyatt is mere, um, that was given by the Ngati Te Ira Princess Tamairangi, uh, which seated the mana of Whanganui Atara, resides at Parliament House to remind everybody that Ngati Toa, through Tarangi Hyatt once again, and his foresight to marry Tamairangi. Uh, and take her to wife, and of course accepting the mere paunamu tafito whenua gave him the mana over to Whanganui Atara. Which you can see why he takes exception to things happening in Wellington and out the hut, because he probably thought that, hey, they, I have the mana of that whole area, so why wouldn't he get upset if other tribes say that he, uh, or the kawana come in to say that, oh, they, he no longer has mana in these areas. So. Mm. We've spent our treaty came to make sure that that story has been put right. And now Tafito Whenua resides at Parliament Parliament House to this day, so. Okay, well, um, yeah, just getting back to the end. Yeah, how do you, you know, tell me your whakaaro around, how has history remembered those two rangatira, te rangi, haiata and te rauparaha? How has history remembered te rangi, haiata and te rauparaha? Um, I think that those two chiefs, um, I think those two chiefs have been given a bit of a raw deal in terms of history. Unfortunately, they're, they are victims of other people with their cultural perspectives, um, giving their opinions and causing influence over our history. Um, and as, as simple as words like that Tarangi Hayata was chased up through Horokiri and but no, he absolutely planned where he was going to take on, like I say, the might of the British Empire. He knew his resources. He knew that taking on armies head on isn't resource sufficient. He understands that me hai hai matariki, uh, that we need to be like matariki or plaides and split up into these little groups and harass. So these are all strategies and, and that I think have never really been taken into account in any of the historical facts about Te Raupraha. And we won't be, and we can't commemorate uh, the Battle of Battle Hill and Waido until those understandings have become, uh, until our story has been given. Uh, and our versions of events. Um, and so I'm hoping that, although Te Raupraha is one of the most highly written about New Zealanders in New Zealand history, um, they still didn't really get the facts right. It, a lot of the facts were um, done through biased, uh, Pākehā biased, um, sorry. That's fine. Sit on the back of your that's right. Yeah. That's right. Stop there, and we'll just carry on because okay. I, I got the. F you got there. You were just carrying on a bit. I don't mean that in a bit. <laughs> yeah, no, I know what you mean. <laughs> um, I need to. So this is a bit. This is bitsy now because I just need you to talk about them. Yeah. Um, ka mate, you know your iwi is internationally known for that that haka. Tell us about where it came from and why was it written. Sure, um, and uh, that that haka is part of a of, of a long haka 
In fact, I think there's a series of about five aka relative to uh, Kamate. And according to our histories, that they were all written from, written by Taropraha or composed by Taropraha. One being Heoranga Nei, uh, Uhi Tai, Kiki Ki, Kamate, and Katuki Tuki. So the Taonga that was given to the nation was Kamate. And that uh, explains uh, some of the happenings and events of Te Raupraha while coming down from Kafia, had managed to slip away to other areas seeking support. And in one of those uh, travels, he went over to visit his relations in uh, Tufareto. And there's another example of Pākehā historians saying that he was chased over there, uh, that somewhere along the line that uh, he was that a group had heard that he was in the area and so they chased him over to, to Whareto. Well, actually, he was initially just over there visiting his cousin, uh, Mananui Te Heuhe. And unless you understand the whakapapa, you could probably say that he was just over there. Uh, he had been chased there, but he was actually visiting his relations. And whilst there, uh, they had heard uh, that there were some enemy tribes looking for him. And so Mananui decided that all oh, might be better that you go down to my cousin, Te Farerangi, at uh, Lake Rotoaira. And what he did, he took his advice uh, and he made his way to Rotoaira. Uh, and of course the story is, is that um, Te Farerangi and his wife, Te Rangi Kuaia, uh, took him in and, and, sh and because he was being pursued by this war party, they placed him in, into a kumara pit. If you go to Tu Whareto, they'll tell you it was a taiawa or potato pit. Uh, and they'll tell you that it was on the on the mainland of the lake at um, over there, but we but for us it was actually on the island or Te Motu or Puhi. Puhi. Um, whether it was on the mainland or not, there was a kumara pit or a potato pit, and he made his way down there and probably somewhat angst at finding himself in that position, uh, and luckily enough. Uh, te Whare Rangi and, uh, had placed Te Rangi Kuaia over the entrance of the Kumara Pit. And um, if you ever see the Kumara Pit, you'll see that it's down on a, like a 45 degree angle. And so she would have been sitting up in front of him. Um, and the reason being is that they had a tohunga uh, in the enemy party who was able to track him spiritually. And I don't know how to explain that, but metaphysically, uh, he was able to be pursued through tohunga or, or seers uh, of spirits. And so um, by having Te Rangi Kuaia at the front of the thing, was able to dissipate some of that uh, tohunga's energy. And so uh, after a couple of times of going around the pa, they decided to move on and pursue uh, Te Raupraha. At which stage Te Rangi Kuaia had moved away from the entrance and only with the grandeur of Te Raupraha, after being in a sort of a sticky situation, um, was able to come out, and only he could sort of come out with the gusto and have a whole haka like kamate. I thought I was going to die, I thought I was going to die, I live, I live. Kaora, kaora. And really that's essentially the legacy of Ngāti Tōr, is that uh, we only had a dream and a haka. <laughs> a dream and a haka. <laughs> Uh, to get us here and uh, Te Raupraha, luckily at the, the aroha of his relations of Tu Whare Tor, that he was actually able to live another day and probably considering the situation he had found himself in, uh, that he was able to cause the sun to shine on him again, which, which was something very rarely done in Te Ao Māori back in the day. Uh, once you made a mistake, it could generally be death. Uh, but he was able to cause the, si uh, the sun to shine on him, meaning the, that the prosperity of Ngāti Tōr would, be, would go forward into the future. And so that's that line at the end that says, Kaupane, kaupane, fiti te rā. The sun shines on me again. And that's why we don't have he on the end. And if you're an all black, you can do he. Uh, but if you're a Ngāti Tōr, we don't encourage using the he because it doesn't finish. The sun never stops shining on Ngāti Tōa, uh, so we don't have a he. And so really that's the kamate to me. It talks about a little tribe, 
uh, punching above weight. It talks about that sometimes the little guy can beat up the big guy. If you have good leadership, um, and, uh, and I might say against them, some huge odds, and they fought a lot of big tribes, a little tribe like Ngāti Tō. Um, and, and Kamate to me exemplifies um, our ability to overcome the worst of adversities. Um, and if you look at our history, uh, there would have been some very, very traumatic things happen that even today's generation really can't grasp the loss of, how can you grasp the loss of a language your cultural customary practices have now gone. Your access to areas have become meagre. So it must have been quite a sad, for a lot of those Māori speaking generations, it would have been quite sad for them to see um, the result of that. And of course, Ngāti Tō and, and the area that the Kawana chose to put their whare pare mata or their Kawana tanga um, had a lot of causal effects on Ngāti Tō. Um, that was another way of stating their, their mana over things Māori. Uh, the fact that they arrested Te Raupraha and held the next echelon of chiefs to ransom uh, are all indicative of the time. And uh, all I can say is that, like I said, all we had was a dream to move down here in Ahaka and it got us this far. And uh, the leadership of Te Rangi Haiata, the consummate... Um, chief versus the dictator or the good cop and the bad cop, however you want to look at it, uh, was and, and the advice of his sister and the wahine was absolutely played to the success of our tribe. And that's why I think even today our women play a major part in all the decisions of Ngāti Tō. Um, and I think that's a trait that's been passed down. I can't speak for other tribes, but I know that uh, the leadership of our wahine, kia whakarungo ki te kōpara tu whārangi. You must listen to the bell bird that sings in the whārangi tree. And there's lots and lots of explanations to that, but it's absolutely indicative of our wahine and the leadership roles that they played. I think we had five signed the Treaty of Waitangi, you know, just from Ngāti Tō alone. And there wouldn't have been many women signing uh, the Treaty of Waitangi. But I do know that there were a few, but um, at least five or six of them came from Ngāti Tō. So it shows you the, uh, the consideration that our male leadership had for our wahine. I think there was 13 eh? or 19, there, so there weren't many. That's... 13, no, there weren't many, and I mean a th quarter of them come from us. OK, um, love that quarter at all. No wonder the bloody All Blacks keep winning. <laughs> well, they come over to Hongaweka. And we let them know the real quarter, and that's when they went to the World Cup and won. And they're like, holy shit, we've got to go out there. Yeah. We tried to get them to Kapiti, but it was logistically too he, hard. Old um, Te Rangi, uh, he'd be quite chuffed too that his haka had gone internationally. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to bring you back to um, the bit that you talked to Mahanga about, where they put a piece of bread underneath the head or the ear or the neck, the kaki yeah. of um, Wakefield. Yeah, so following the incident at Wairo, why was that? Why did that happen? Um, it it actually shows that the it shows how the, or the perspective of Nati Tor towards Wakefield and towards that group of that came over from Nelson, and it's an old custom. It's an old custom of defiling uh, the mana or the tapu of a chief by placing food in or around the head area which was considered absolute sacred or tapu to those chiefs of that time. Uh, so that's a gesture, I suppose, of Ngāti Tō telling everyone, and, and uh, it holds a little bit of history in terms of that event, that they saw that person as being the person responsible for the whole, um, the whole situation and how it escalated by, de by taking away his mana. And that was Ngāti Tō making the statement that this is the guy uh, that was responsible, in my way of thinking. And it's an old tradition of defiling their mana or their tapu. Mm. And so that's our historical way of saying, yep, we put the blame on this guy, Wakefield, and his um, wanting and exigence uh, for acquiring that land in Wairau. And of course, which he paid the price, the ultimate price.